Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, wonderful to see uh, so many people here for this very interesting event that we're about to, to experience. My name is Elaine Mullen, and I'm here to introduce this fourth event of the Critical Thinking series. First, I'd like to emphasize that this series is not a debate intended to determine a winner. Rather, it is designed to provide a place for discussion and questions in an effort to increase understanding of issues. In the words of French essayist and moralist, Joseph Joubert, the aim of argument or discussion should not be victory, but progress. The Critical Thinking Series has been organized by the Rational Space Network, a loosely organized group of about 20 professors who agree that a university is a place for open inquiry, critical thinking, and evidence-based approaches to decision-making. The network is intent on promoting academic freedom and freedom of expression on campus. It has received significant funding from the Faculty of Arts, the Department of Economics, Justice, and Policy Studies, and the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. And this support has greatly been appreciated and has enabled it to uh, bring a number of interesting and provocative um, perspectives to showcase at Mount Royal University. This academic year, the network has organized sections on the following questions. Is Canada's support for Israel justifiable? Should universities vet who speaks on campus? And is capitalism sustainable? And the network welcomes your suggestions for further topics that could be discussed going forward. The Rational Space Network shares the assertion of John Stuart Mill when he spoke of the deep slumber of decided opinion. So the critical thinking series puts forward a, a contentious question and then provides a framework to have the question analyzed and discussed in a systematic fashion. And Peter will be explaining what that framework is for today. We believe that open examination of all ideas, even controversial ones, is central to the health of an academic institution. Today, the fourth session of the Critical Thinking series asks the question, does trans activism negatively impact women's rights? Trans activism has become increasingly prominent in the world today, and yet there is nervousness about asking questions related to the implications. This appears to be the first time, in fact, that trans activism will be discussed critically on a university in campus in Canada. I am looking forward to this afternoon's discussion, and I hope that we will all make progress and reach a better understanding of this question by listening intently and respectfully to the differing perspectives. And now I'll introduce our presenters. Megan Murphy, the founder of the popular feminist website, The Feminist Current, will be arguing that trans activism does negatively impact women's rights. Murphy has published work in numerous national and international publications. The Feminist Current's podcast has been on the air since 2012. And Murphy's newest project is a YouTube channel Murphy holds a master's degree in gender, sexuality, and women's studies, and recently completed a book critiquing third wave feminism. Presenting the other side of the question is Julie Ray Goldstein, an actress and voiceover artist from California. Goldstein has been performing in a multitude of mediums over the last decade, including animation, video games, and television. She's been seen on Adult Swim, Tim and Eric, Nickelodeon, Henry Danger, Comedy Central, Time Traveling Bong, and most recently on the CBS show, SWAT. 
As a staunch trans feminist, Goldstein has written for Time, contributed to seven, several pieces on Salon.com, and appeared on the Louder with Crowder show and the Wrong Speak podcast. So please welcome me in joining Megan Murphy and Julie Ray Goldstein to Mount Royal University. Thank you, and I'll turn the event over to our moderator, Dr. Peter Zisler. Thank you, Elaine. I appreciate the introduction. So I'd like to welcome everyone again. I'm very excited about moderating this uh, event. Uh, just a few uh, s um, comments. The way we're going to run it is as follows. Megan and Julie will get each 10 minutes to introduce uh, their stance, their positions, and they're going to speak. Uh, then afterwards, uh, they'll have five minutes each to respond to each other's uh, stances. Then the facilitators, uh, Mark and uh, Francis, will get about half an hour, 30 minutes, to kind of probe into the stances and kind of digest possible questions or just clarify stuff associated with that. And then we'll finally open it up for questions. Uh, the way we're going to let the questions is as follows. If you could kindly just approach the microphone and introduce yourself and ask a question to uh, either uh, Julie Ray or Megan. And uh, if I can just ask to maybe ask pretty much equal questions to both uh, panelists, please. And so it's not one-sided. And uh, I'm expecting a very good event. I'm very excited and I'm very pleased with you know all the people sitting anxious to start and to begin, so I think we should begin. Uh, decision, who starts first is done by the most random thing still being used in, in the world, and it's a toss of a coin. Um, I have a toonie, I hope that's okay. So I'm gonna toss it on the floor, uh, not to make a show out of it, and, uh, and uh, I'll ask, as a mathematician, uh, I forgot to introduce myself really again. Uh, I'm Peter Sisler, a mathematician from mathematics and computing. So I can ask, say, Megan to choose, and then uh, it's equivalent. Uh, so Megan, heads or tails? Tails. <laughs> it's heads. It's heads. Thank you. question. I don't know. No. <laughs> it will be posted on the Rational Space Network's YouTube channel. So if you just Google Rational Space Network and YouTube, it will be there. Okay. Hi. My position is that trans rights and women's rights are not in opposition. They are directly complementary. And the real question is, does general critical activism negatively affect women's rights? Advocating against trans rights would set the framework to dismantle the advances feminists have made over the last few decades. The right to body autonomy and freedom from discrimination based on biological essentialism are fundamental tenets of feminism. These are the exact same principles upon which trans activism and trans feminism is rooted. As Emma Lazarus said, until we are all free, we are none of us free. Contrary to how general critical activists depict trans rights as based on feelings, Misogynistic oppression, discrimination, harassment, and violence are actually based in societal perception rather than reproductive capability. No one is denying that the root of the patriarchy is, a, is indeed based in biology, but the way we experience it in society is not dependent on it. The presence of certain genitals or reproductive organs do not make someone who is perceived as a woman or feminine safer from violence on the street or discrimination in employment. If anything, the more one strays from what society considers the norm in either direction, the more they are prone to these injustices. 
Nowhere is this more evident than when we enforce bathroom regulations aimed at preventing trans people from using the facilities that correspond to their gender identity. Gender critical activists will claim non-discrimination ordinances erode women's rights to privacy. The truth is that when anti-trans regulations are enforced, those most commonly targeted are actually gender non-conforming cisgender women. We've all heard of these cases. Je Jessica Rush was followed into the bathroom at Baylor Medical Center in Frisco by someone who thought she looked like a man and wanted to protect other women. Amy Toms was kicked out of restroom in a Walmart in Danbury. And what of trans people in restrooms? The truth is, when there's a violent incident in a restroom, trans people are typically the victims and extremely rarely the aggressors. A 2013 survey published by the Williams Institute, for example, found that 70% of trans and gender non-conforming respondents in the Washington, D.C. area faced a negative reaction while trying to use the public bathroom, including 9% who reported physical assault. Look at the case of Chrissy Lee Paulus, who was beaten by two cisgender women for using a McDonald's bathroom as the onlookers stood and videotaped her rather than helped. In fact, a 2016 report by Media Matters interviewed <laughs> interviewed experts from 16 states in the District of Columbia, including law enforcement officials and advocates for victims of sexual assault, who reported no issues whatsoever as a result of non-discrimination protections. This doesn't even begin to take into account the fact that anti-trans regulations would force trans men, who are commonly perceived as male with male sex secondary sex characteristics, to use female facilities. If this is in the service of making women feel more comfortable in private, how does having to share a restroom with a trans man make cisgender women safer and more comfortable? And in that case, what would prevent a would-be criminal looking to access female facilities from simply stating he's a trans man? Mm -hmm. This gets to the heart of the matter. When it comes to facilities, we are and have been historically better served by policing activity and not identity. It doesn't matter what an individual's sex or gender identity is, if they commit lewd or lascivious behavior in a restroom or locker room, they should rightfully be arrested or prosecuted. And prosecuted. As to the issue of body autonomy, the current ties between the gender critical movement and conservatives cannot be overstated enough. Just over a month ago, Ms. Murphy herself was in Washington, D.C. with several of her colleagues who spoke at the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, on what they see as the dangers of allowing trans youth to medically transition. These groups both cite a recent Dutch study that found trans people on hormone therapy have an increased risk for DVT and cardiovascular events even though the authors couldn't control for smoking, weight, diet, or other risk factors, meaning they couldn't make a direct cause and effect link. And they knew, because they stated it in the study, that the prevalence rates of smoking within the trans population were as high as 46%. That sounds important to me. Just last week, the Heritage Foundation also published the finding of a systematic review showing another powerful hormonal medication increased VTE risks and the likelihood of cardiovascular events, even higher than that of hormone replacement therapy as used in trans individuals. That medication is birth control. These same organizations incorrectly cite Dr. Cecilia DeGene's long-term study on trans surgery to claim that gender reassignment surgery increases suicidality. Not surprisingly, the week before Heritage Panel on Trans Rights, they also had another panel where speakers cited data to claim that there was another surgical procedure that drastically increased suicidality. Big surprise, that surgical procedure is abortion. Conservatives are not simply partnering with gender critical activists out of anti-trans sentiments. This is a deliberate Trojan horse to set the president to dismantle the advances made on LGB and women's rights over the last few decades. Sadly, gender critical activists have taken the bait, hook, line, and sinker. By partnering with conservative organizations to limit access to medical transition, gender critical activists have directly, albeit maybe unconsciously, assisted them in limited women's access to reproductive care as well. The battle cry of feminism used to be my body, my choice. It appears that under gender critical activism, that has morphed into your body, my choice. They not only actively advocate against choice in medical care for trans people that will have real life consequences on women's reproductive care, they also advocate against women having the freedom to choose to do sex work if they so desire. Now, no one is saying that we shouldn't be critical of the causes of sexualization of women in our society. But the problem is that limiting choice in sex work, as in reproductive care or trans-related care, goes directly against the principles feminism was founded upon and serves only to further marginalization and abuse of those most vulnerable, especially po um, people of color and uh, LGBT people. The use of anti-trans rhetoric to legally dismantle LGB and women's rights isn't a theoretical. We're already seeing it in practice. Martina Navratilova's comments on trans athletes was used just a few weeks ago by opponents of LGBT equality in a Montana State Legislature, ju <coughs> legislature judicial, com judicial Committee 
as a reason to not expand the state's Human Rights Act to include LGBTQ people. In South Dakota, HB 1205 was introduced under the guise of allowing parents to have complete control over the decision for their children to access transgender-related medical care. However, as the bill's sponsor, Representative Fry Mueller, said during the hearing, during the hearing, human rights do not outrank parents' rights to the child. Think about that for a second. Beyond trans-related medical care, this would also allow parents complete control to their children's access to birth control and or abortion services, giving them the ability to force a minor to carry a pregnancy to term, as her human rights as a woman would legally be able to be undermined by parental rights. Now, speaking of Bertina Navratilova, we seem to be hearing more commonly that allowing trans people to compete in sports endangers women's sports. Nothing could be farther from the truth. A systematic review published a few months after the new IOC standards were released, taking into account the studies of the effects of hormonal treatment and policies governing medical qualification for competition, found there is no direct or consistent research suggesting trans female individuals have an athletic advantage at any stage of their transition. In fact, the most successful transgender athletes, athletes on the world stage have been transgender men. The only trans athlete to have qualified for Team USA as of today is Chris Mosier for the men's duathlon team. If such advantages were innate based on assigned at birth sex and not more complex medical qualifications, these athletes shouldn't be able to compete on a level playing field. As is the case in other areas, anti-trans policies don't just negatively affect <coughs> trans people, they also negatively affect cis women. Look at the case of Mac Betts, a trans boy who was forced to compete against girls due to policies specifically designed to target trans high school students in the state of Texas. To the surprise of no one, he won the state's girls' title two years in a row. Thankfully, he's moving on to a collegiate system with trans-inclusive policies where he has been offered a scholarship to wrestle in the men's division at an NAIA school, and he's been winning against boys. It gets even worse. Navratilova's words are also being used to police the sex of cisgender female ath athletes. Castro Semenya is currently in battle with the IAF, who are trying to force her to take testosterone-reducing medication in order to further compete. These are flawed simplifications that fail to see the big picture that's perpetuated by gender-critical activists who cite data comparing cisgender male athletes who do not qualify for female competition in the women's categories based on IOC regulation to cisgender women which fails to take into account the changes in muscle mass, fat distribution, bone density, and more that occur once someone falls under their qualifications. Gender critical activists, by comparing cis men to cis women and not trans women who have undergone medical treatment to cis women, are comparing apples to oranges. That's not to say a discussion can't be had, and if we see changes happen, it certainly qualifies for a discussion, but it has to be based in data and not feelings. The data so far just does justify the current regulations and does not justify eliminating trans women from competition. There's obviously many more items that we could be discussing and we should be in the future, but I hope that by having these conversations with those who strongly consider themselves to be feminists, which I do, you can get a bigger sense of the bigger picture rather than prioritizing anti-trans sentiment and come to see the truth behind the damage the general critical activist movement can cause to both trans and cis women alike. terms. So one thing that you'll find comes up over and over and over again in this debate is that those who advocate gender identity ideology and legislation refuse to define their terms in clear and coherent ways. This makes genuine conversation and debate impossible. Without their definitions, words mean nothing and communication goes nowhere. So when I say sex, I'm referring to biology whether an individual is male or female. I define a man as an adult male human, and a woman as an adult female human. This is how most of the world for most of history has understood, understood the terms man and woman. When I say gender, what I mean is the stereotypes and social roles 
imposed on males and females based on their sex. So this is what I mean when I talk about femininity and masculinity. So the ideas we hold in our society about what men, women and men should be, uh, what social norms we're expected to adhere to, what kinds of jobs we should have, what we should like, how we should dress, what our personality traits should consist of. Uh, when I say trans activist, I'm not specifically or necessarily talking about trans identified people. Um, I'm talking about people who promote and support gender identity I ideology and legislation. When I say gender identity ideology or transgender ideology, I'm referring to the idea that it's possible to be born in the wrong body or that it's possible for a person to change sex. When I talk about gender identity legislation, I'm referring to legislation and policies that allow people to self-identify as any sex they like and to access facilities, spaces, political positions, shelters, jobs, grants, universities, sports, competitions, etc. on that basis. Um, I do not use the term cis, which is a word created by trans activists to refer to people whose gender identity matches their sex. This is because I do not have a gender identity, and in fact no one does. We have bodies and we have personalities. And my personality is not a set of stereotypes. And I refuse to identify myself with a set of stereotypes that have been used to defend sexist practices and beliefs throughout history. I am also not a biological essentialist. Biological essentialism is the idea that an individual's personality is an innate or natural essence, and that this is directly attached to their sex. So, for example, the idea that a person is born with a gender identity that is hardwired, and that if that gender identity fits the stereotypes offered up to us by the notion of, for example, femininity, that person must be female. That's what biological essentialism is. Um, I believe that males and females can have all kinds of personalities. I believe that boys and girls should be allowed to play with whichever toys they like and wear whatever clothes they like, regardless of whether or not those clothes and toys are designated for girls or for boys. I do not believe that all females are inherently passive, irrational, emotional, and drawn to makeup and heels. I don't believe that all males are inherently unemotional, rational, and aggressive, and drawn to sports and trucks. <laughs> I want people to be free to be themselves and free to live their lives uh, in ways that feel authentic and fulfilling to them. I don't believe any person should be discriminated against or harassed because they step outside the gender stereotypes laid out for us and enforced on us in so many ways. As a feminist, I think we should encourage people to step out of gender stereotypes. This also means that I do not believe that because, for example, a boy likes pink and wants to play with dolls, that this means that he's not male, but in fact female. I think this is an incredibly regressive, sexist, and irrational point of view. I don't think that boys are limited to the narrow confines of masculinity. I don't think that girls are limited to the narrow confines of fem femininity, as we understand those ideas today in our society. This has always been what feminism has advocated, and I am continually baffled by the extent to which our arguments are misrepresented and lied about, even professors here on campus who are in the gender studies department and should know better, seem not to know or understand feminist theory and analysis with regard to sex and gender. Nor do they seem to understand the history of women's oppression, patriarchy, or why women's rights exist in the first place. Uh, one professor here, uh, Kim Williams, who apparently teaches in the Gender and Women's Studies Department, claims that feminists who argue that trans activism stimmies women's rights is, this is her quote, incongruous to the foundational liberatory ten tenets of feminist praxis. praxis. Um, and meanwhile, a University of Calgary professor named Rebecca Sullivan, who specializes in feminist media and cultural studies, claimed to, that even to ask the question of how gender identity ideology and legislation impacts women's rights is the antithesis of critical thinking and beneath the integrity of any university. So um, the purpose of universities is to think and ask critical questions and learn how to form coherent evidence-based arguments. Yet today, too many, even these professors, are instead invested in the opposite 
silencing and discouraging critical thought. I am frankly shocked at how little these people know about their own discipline and the history of the feminist movement. These statements are so dangerous and ironic to me because the truth is that it is trans activists that refuse to engage in critical thinking with regard to their own ideology. So much so that anyone who dares even to ask questions, never mind challenge their premises, is silenced, you know, platformed, smeared, bullied, and threatened. This, in fact, is beneath the integrity of any university. Not asking critical questions and engaging in respectful debate. So, one of the reasons I challenge gender identity ideology is because I think it's progressive, sexist, and nonsensical. I think it limits us, rather than allowing us a full range of options as human beings with diverse interests and personality traits. But I also think that it has incredibly negative impacts on women's rights in particular. And I think it's important that when enacting legislation and making sweeping changes to policies that impact women and girls, we absolutely should be having a conversation about it and engaging in rigorous public debate. Patriarchy came to be as a means to control women's reproductive abilities. In other words, it is based on our bodies. It's not based on our personalities or choice in clothing. It's based on the fact that we're born female. Stereotypes around gender were imposed on us and used against us to limit our choices, power, and freedom. In the not so distant past, women were not allowed to vote or hold public office because of gender. Women's place was in the home and they were said to be too delicate too emotional and too irrational to participate in politics and public life. We were kept out of universities. We were kept out of certain careers. The fact that we were capable of having babies meant that we, want, like once we made it to the workplace, we were discriminated against and not given promotions, for example. On December 6, 1989, a young man walked into a classroom at École Polytechnique, an engineering school in Montreal, and separated the students into two groups, male and female. He directed the men to leave the room and shouted, I hate feminists, before firing at the women, killing 14 of them. He did this because he believed those women should not be taking up space in the traditionally male-dominated realm of engineering. In other words, he did this because these women were defying gender stereotypes. Gender, under patriarchy, is not our friend. It is not liberatory, it is not something to be embraced. Today, women have specific rights based on the history and reality of sex-based oppression. We also have specific sex-segregated spaces based on the understanding that men pose a threat to women. Not all men, but only men. Female firefighters had to fight in order to have access to their own locker rooms and facilities because they were being subjected to sexual harassment and assault in the shared spaces. They only won this fight recently in Canada. Now, we're being told that we must allow men into these spaces if they claim to feel feminine, whatever that means. Feminists built and funded transition houses for women escaping male violence. Now, they're being told it is discriminatory to maintain those spaces as women only in order to keep the women who need those spaces safe and offer them a place to heal from the violence and abuse they experienced, away from those they perceive as a threat. Women had to fight in order for women's sport to be taken seriously. They had to fight for it to exist at all. They had to fight in order to have the right to compete on fair ground, and now all that is being lost, as sports bodies around the world are adopting policies that allow male athletes who identify as transgender to compete against and among women and girls. On what basis do women's rights exist if the word woman is meaningless? If anyone can identify in and out of femaleness on a whim. Whether we want to admit it or not, males and females are physically different. And this world has been built based on the idea of the male as the norm. So this means that cars have been designed for male bodies, medical studies have been done primarily on men, office temperatures are set based on what's comfortable for the male body, Studies done on how certain pharmaceutical drugs impact people have been conducted on men, not women. Women die from heart attacks more often than men 
because women's heart attack symptoms are completely different than men's, and so we don't recognize when a woman is having a heart attack. Men have more muscle mass, longer limbs, bigger organs, and different bones than women. Their pelvises, spines, and feet are different. They move their bodies differently and have a different center of gravity. This all has a notable impact on athletic ability, among other things. And none of this can be altered substantially through surgery or hormone treatments. Decreasing testosterone does not change the physical body of a male to such an extent that it becomes a female body. So when, for example, we're talking about things like health and women's sport, it is actually incredibly important to differentiate between male and female bodies. Women and girls are at risk of losing the ability to compete at all if they're forced to compete against male athletes who will be stronger than them no matter how hard they train. If we wish to maintain women's rights and protect women's spaces, we cannot separate women from femaleness. It is irrational and dangerous. It makes women and girls vulnerable. Beyond that, there is absolutely no reason why we cannot protect the rights of individuals to step outside of gender roles and to express themselves as they like, and also understand that sexual dimorphism is real, that male and males and females exist, and that those differences, both in terms of the physical, as well as in terms of what this is meant socially, matters. Okay, excellent. Now we go back to the uh, begin uh, the five minute responses uh, to each uh, panel. So I give the floor to Julie Wayne. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be bouncing around a little. There's a lot there to digest. Um, one thing that uh, Megan says a lot is definitions. Now let's let's make sure that we have certain definitions uh, clear. Gender identity, and I I like to make this distinction a lot, is a very misleading term. When you say gender identity, it makes it sound like it just has to do with gender as to social socialization and social cues. That's actually not true. Gender identity is a complex interconnection of sex and gender. You have to understand that in order to state what gender identity is and basically state it as regressive or not, which it's not. In the sense that the trans activists actually were the ones who pushed for the DSM-4 to DSM-5 change. In the DSM-4, uh, gender identity disorder was conflated between gender non-conforming behavior and gender dysphoria. The DSM-4 did not distinguish between these two. That's why you had those high rates of desistance. It wasn't gender kids with gender dysphoria, it was gender non-conforming kids who later went on to become gays or lesbians. That's an important distinction to make. The DSM-5 specifically differentiates gender non-conforming behavior from gender dysphoria, and that is because trans activists fought for decades to get that changed. Now, as to what woman is, woman is actually a social construct. It's, there's no concrete definition, and the reason for that saying, if you want to define it, there's no way, I, I'm going to throw the question back. Is there a way that gender critical activists can define woman to exclude trans women without excluding some cis women? There's no possible way of doing that. And that's because woman is a social construct based on observations assigned at birth that are a lot more complex than that. Biology is not just genitals. Biology is not just secondary sex characteristics. It's complex. Yes, you have chromosomes, you have hormones, you have secondary sex characteristics, genital, genitals, reproductive uh, capabilities, and the, the brain too. It, it, it's interesting to me that gender critical activists are so quick to point out that genitals are sexually dimorphic, yet they deny that brains are sexually dimorphic as well. And I'm not stating that as a qualitative thing. It's not to say that women are better than this, or better than that, or men are better than, at this, or better than that. But there is neurological distinctions, which is currently thought to be the cause of gender dysphoria. As for the sports medical definition, I again go back to the data. 15 years the uh, IOC has allowed trans athletes to compete. Guess how many trans athletes have competed in the Olympics since? Zero. 
and it just hasn't changed. We can have these conversations, but they have to be based on data. Now, as to the idea of socialization, it's a true idea, but the problem is, based on your perception, is not the full picture of socialization. Socialization is how you absorb what society is telling you. A trans girl who knows she's a girl but is treated as a boy is still going to take in those same social cues telling her what a woman should be. And that's why commonly you have trans women having to be hyper-feminine in order to be taken seriously historically by the medical profession. This was commonly referred to as gatekeeping where if you did not fall under the perfect model for transgender people, you were denied medical treatment, you were denied surgery. That affected trans people just as much. It actually it affected us even more because we couldn't access healthcare unless we, quote unquote, performed femininity. Um, as, for <laughs> as for stereotypes, trans people have the same hardships with falling out of these same stereotypes. Just because of certain genitals or certain reproductive systems it doesn't make you safer. It doesn't make you less likely to be paid less. I actually have had to fight that, that exact same battle when I found out that a male colleague of mine was hired for the exact same position as me for a higher wage. It didn't matter how I was born. It just mattered that I was considered to be a woman and he was considered to be a man. So the other thing I want to say is I've always been against threats. I don't think we should be saying, stating threats, physical threats, any type of threats on either side. Now what I want to finish with is the idea of bathrooms and specific spaces. You have the right to be safe. You don't have the right to feel safe. There is no data that shows that non-discrimination ordinances and allowing trans women the right to access spaces based on their gender identity makes anybody any less safe. If you want to make the argument that it makes you feel safer, that's one to be made. But you don't have the right to feel safe. You have the right to be safe. And there is no safety concern. And until we have that data, things are just going to keep going in the direction towards being more trans-inclusive. Thank you. Now, Megan, please. Uh, lots to respond to, so yeah, I'll probably be bouncing around a little also. Um, so I wanted to respond to a couple things that Julie said uh, at the beginning there. Um, I've never spoken at the Heritage Foundation before. Um, I support women who want to speak to right-wing people. My politics uh, are not the same as the Heritage Foundation's politics. We have nothing in common. I'm a socialist. I support public health care, I'm opposed to privatization, I support access to abortion for all women all the time. Uh, I support lesbian and gay rights. Yes. So, uh, I mean, the idea that somehow we change all our politics by having conversations with people we disagree with makes no sense. I mean, we're all having a conversation right now about things that we disagree on. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to clarify. Uh, I, you know, whether or not a person is male or female can be determined very easily. It can be determined by a blood test. Researchers can tell if bones that are thousands of, year old, thousands of years old belonged to a male or female. I don't understand why, in order to accept people as they are and to oppose discrimination and harassment, we need to pretend that a person is literally the opposite sex, and in fact, pretending that will endanger that person. Like, if your doctor doesn't know if you're male or female, that endangers you. Your doctor can tell, of course. Uh, your doctor is a turf. But uh, <laughs> uh, that's an important thing for people to know. Uh, sex matters. Um, I don't understand why we're focusing so heavily on bathrooms because I don't ever really say anything about bathrooms. 
Um, I think that it's a way to derail the conversation. There are much more important issues at hand. I think the bathroom issue can be dealt with pretty easily. I'm sure that trans women have been using women's bathroom for bathrooms for a long time, and it's not made a difference to anyone. Um, I think that we should be making single cell gender neutral bathrooms everywhere. This is the responsibility of public facilities and city buildings and universities. Um, I don't think anyone should feel unsafe in a bathroom. As far as spaces go, I don't understand why uh, women who uh, are subjected to violence at the hands of men need to be made vulnerable or feel unsafe because trans-identified males also are subjected to violence at the hand of men. So we need to be dealing with male violence. I don't think that it's necessary for women to be put at risk in order to also protect men from male violence. Um, and that's not on us, you know, like it's not feminist's fault that men are perpetrating violence against women and other men. That's what we've been fighting this whole time, male violence. Um, so the main issues that I focused on are the right for women to organize amongst themselves. We have a right um, as an oppressed group of people. So women are, it's been determined under law that women are depressed, or depressed. Some of us are. This is kind of depressing. <laughs> uh, oppressed based on their sex. So we have the right to organize amongst ourselves on that basis. Indigenous people also have the right to organize only among indigenous people and have spaces and services that are specific to indigenous people. So I feel like this argument that you know, like a transition house that's for women only needs to welcome men in would be exactly the same as demanding that a service that's offered to, you know, indigenous mothers to include uh, indigenous men or white women. Um, uh, yeah, again, I mean, I think that, I think that feminists and trans activists could be on the same page if there was any respect at all for the work that women have done in terms of gaining rights and gaining spaces. And we would fully support trans-identified people in building their own transition houses. And we support the creation of services specifically for trans-identified people. But that doesn't mean we give up our rights and our spaces. Um, gender identity has nothing to do with sex. Julie said it did, I have no idea how. Uh, sex is physical. It's how you're born. There's nothing you can do about your body or sex. Um, uh, yeah, I think that, again, it's important for us to all accept people as they are. I don't think that entails lying. Thanks. Thank you to both panelists, um, thank you very much. And now I turn the floor to our facilitators, uh, Francis and Mark. Uh, they'll spend the, the, about 30 minutes probing into every panelist's position by asking questions. Uh, I assume it will be kind of collegially divided into two halves on their own. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, this is great. This is very intellectual. And this is what we want. Um, the, uh, Mark and I haven't really coordinated ourselves very well here because Mark insisted and he said that we had to be more uh, authentic and less, you know, prepared. So we're, I'm not as prepared as I would like to be. Um, but that's good because we're supposed to be thinking on our feet. We're supposed to be thinking on our feet here. So this is good. Um, so when Mark and I just had a brief conversation ahead of time, um, we thought it would be a good idea for each of us to try to summarize what we think the arguments are that are being made to prevent us from going down a, a, a blind alley and, and not being fair to the presenters. And um, so I said that I would try to summarize Julie's arguments and Mark will try to summarize uh, Megan's arguments. And I'll ask a question. I'll try and summarize your arguments, Julie, and then I'll ask you a question. This is very, very hard. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I don't think I really understand the arguments very well, but I'm going to take a stab at it. Um, one thing that, 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 that struck me was something that you said, um, which was societal perception um, is the importance 
uh, in terms of oppression. So oppression comes from societal perception, not biological reality. You said that. So I think that's kind of almost at the crux of this kind of dispute that exists. And because of this, um, your argument is, is that trans people actually face probably more oppression than uh, what you would call cis women. Because society reacts to trans women more negatively and more oppressively than they do to what you would call cis women, to, to women who are born biological women. Um, and this has, had, has a number of consequences in terms of how trans people are treated, but it also has terrible consequences, uh, you argue, for what you would call cis women. Um, because, um, for example, uh, butch, I assume butch lesbians who try to use women's washrooms come under attack because um, the, all the sort of the antagonism towards trans people that they're facing also spills over towards the oppression of uh, butch lesbians in washrooms and people try to stop them from using women's washrooms because of all the debates that are going on about, uh, about trans issues. Um, the second area is the conservative think tank. This is another problem. Um, because um, many uh, gender critical feminists, what's called gender critical feminists, are aligning themselves with right wing organizations, this is having um, a negative impact on women's rights because conservative thinkers um, are discriminatory towards women's rights in terms of allowing women uh, access to abortion and birth control. If I say something sure, really go ahead. Quick. So the the point of that is that uh, it's very obvious that conservatives are using gender critical feminists to argue against the anti trans perspective as a Trojan horse because they're making the same arguments against trans people that once they set those precedents, they can easily be turned against both LGB and women's reproductive rights. Okay, um, and then uh, so that's about reproductive choice. And then there were the arguments about sports, um, which I'm, I'm not sure if I understand uh, what this is, but one thing I thought was possible was that um, if we're going to start getting into, and I guess this would be the argument uh, of some people, that if you have XX chromosomes, you can compete in women's sports, and if you have XY chromosomes, you, can, uh, you should compete in men's sports, then, for example, uh, women like Castor Semenius, I think that's her name, she's from South Africa, um, she has like high testosterone and, and those, so she's sort of outside the norm for women, but I think she, she has got uh, chromosomal some of the polarities to women. People like that outside the norm, women like that outside the norm, who are not trans women, they're just women with abnormal levels of, of testosterone, will end up being discriminated as well. So we're kind of encouraging discrimination against actual what you would call cis women who don't fit the norm of uh, what, what women are perceived to supposed to be like biologically. Yeah, basically you're making a simplification by making it just about one thing rather than seeing the whole picture. And where I bring that up is you can't compare um, male athletes who haven't gone through the IOC regulations against women athletes to make this specific argument, you actually have to look at trans female athletes who have gone through that medical um, regulations to be able to compete the, what the current standards for the IOC state and compare those to cisgender women uh, in order to make that point. You can't compare apples to oranges in this case, which cis men are biologically different from trans women who have undergone that Procedure, those procedures, and that's that's a fact. And so the final thing that I, I saw that you were saying um, had to do with um, bio, biology, and I think this is going to be a major area of difference between you and and, uh, and Megan. So you said, uh, I believe that what you said was, woman, the term woman is a social construct. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what you said. And so I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding this. Um, 
I, I know that there are, we do have sexual dimorphism between men and women. There are sort of, you know, in between categories, but there's sort of out, like that's not the standard thing we're dealing with, and I don't think really that's what we're dealing with with trans, many trans people. So I'm just trying to think about what that means. And I don't, I don't quite understand what that means. So that's going to be my question. So what do you mean when you say that woman is a social construct? Well, when I say woman is a social construct, I mean that's based on perception. It's based on things we observe, and actually, it is. Uh, pertinent to bring up both intersex conditions and as well as trans people because if we're looking at brain structure as part of sexual dimorphism you can make the argument that there is a certain level of intersex when we're looking at biology and sex biology I think it's a simplification to just look at genitals uh, biological dimorphism, sexual dimorphism, actually includes chromosomes, it includes hormonal levels, secondary sex characteristics, genitals, reproductive uh, capabilities, and brains. And by looking at just one thing and making the definition based on that one thing, you're excluding, you're going to exclude people that you don't intend to. You have to look at the bigger picture and the sense that trans women, if you look at those who can get currently, um, Identificate for identification purposes, change their sex, uh, they've changed several different portions of that biological reality, either hormonal, secondary sex characteristics, genitals, um, and if you put brains in there, that's that's certainly part of the equation. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Mark now. Thanks. Uh, so, just for the record, uh, I didn't say that Francis and I shouldn't prepare. Uh, I, pre I did quite a bit of preparation. Uh, what I said was that we should react to the back and forth in the moment and not pre-vet or script our questions. Um, and, My mistake. Yes. And I all just to pick up on that mistake a little bit more. I also didn't say. <laughs> I, I, what I did say is I'm actually very uncomfortable being uh, built up here as a critical thinking facilitator. I teach computer science. I have no <laughs> disciplinary expertise in this field. Um, and so I don't bring any sort of theoretical or practitioner critical lens to the subject at all. Um, and so I agreed to participate on, on with the uh, condition that uh, the way I brought my critical lens to the topic uh, is not constrained in any way. Um, so. Uh, first of all, I, I want to preface my uh, reflecting back of, of Megan's position, just so I understand it, uh, just with, with a, a, a statement that um, I'm keenly aware that we're discussing real people uh, and people who can be vulnerable in society and people whose open place in society is tenuous. And my appeal is just for all of us to bear that in mind, even to those in the room who are uh, almost entirely certain that transgendered activism is wrong-headed. Uh, or, or a threat, uh, uh, I think we should all have some intellectual humility, and if there's a chance that, um, that you're wrong about that, uh, again, remember we're discussing real people, um, and uh, I can pat myself on the back and walk away saying we've had a good discussion, um, but uh, I don't belong to any of the equity-seeking groups that we're discussing here, other than my hair's getting gray and my back hurts a lot, uh, so I'm joining um, maybe one equity-seeking group, but I would appeal to the, that we keep that in mind. Uh, so, Ms. Murphy, if I understand your position correctly, uh, it's this. Um, you've argued essentially that protection of, uh, legal protection of gender identity and gender expression is based on a misunderstanding of the nature of gender because it's a social construction uh, as distinct from the physical reality of being male or female. Um, and that in your view, uh, unlike females, um, males who call themselves transgender women could avoid discrimination by simply choosing not to assume various gendered affectations. Um, and that if we did offer legal protections to uh, the transgendered uh, around gender identity and gender expression, it would then uh, remove spaces that are currently safe spaces um, for women, uh, for example, uh, with respect to uh, women's uh, shelters um, and so forth. Is, is that a, an accurate understanding? Um, sure, yeah. I mean, so my opinion is that what, what, what 
calling gender identity and gender expression, so people breaking out of gender stereotypes, for example. So like a male not behaving in a traditionally masculine way, um, that, or like a woman behaving in ways that we would perceive as traditionally masculine, that's protected under sex-based rights. So part of the reason that we have sex-based rights for women is so that we aren't forced into this role of femininity. Um, so I don't think that it's necessary to have laws to protect whatever is called gender identity. I think that what we need to do is ensure that people aren't discriminated against based on you know, their expression and that people are free to exhibit whatever characteristics they like and wear whatever clothes they like. Um, and the issue around things like transition houses, for example, in terms of protecting women's sex-based rights and how gender identity legislation and policies interfere with that. I mean, that's happening already. Just yesterday in Vancouver, the city voted against um, renewing a, a grant that was about $30,000 to Vancouver Rape Relief and Women's Shelter, which is Canada's longest standing transition house and rape crisis center. And that's because they, they offer services only to women and not to men. Um, and Women should have the right to those spaces. Like, I do think that women who've suffered, I mean, the women who come to Vancouver Rape Relief have suffered, like, violence that none of you, or some of you might, but many of you probably can't even imagine. Like, it is horrific. And what those women who work at that shelter do and have done for decades and decades is incredible. They've done it as volunteers. Um, they built this transition house themselves. They fought for funding. They work really hard to help these women. And now we're taking away grants because they disagree with this idea that it's possible for a man to become a woman and that that man should be welcomed into the shelter with women who have just been like beaten up for who knows how many years by their male partners or another man. Um, and like I said, I think that there should be services specific to trans identified people who have suffered violence. And I think that Vancouver Rape Relief has said many times that they would support those services. I would for sure support those services. I can't imagine a feminist in the world who wouldn't support those services, but I also want women to feel safe and to have access to those spaces as well. Thank you. Uh, so I'll move to my question then, uh, which is uh, that uh, by contrast with your, with your position, uh, some, uh, both women and gender studies um, uh, uh, scholars and others, have argued that uh, a binary model of sex in which there's a strict uh, male-female dichotomy is a flawed and a reductionist notion uh, and that it is itself as a, it is itself a social construction. In fact, um, in your opening re remarks, uh, when you defined your terms, uh, you, you made an appeal to the fact that they were time-tested uh, definitions. Uh, it was an appeal essentially to the status quo and through what's been established socially throughout history. Um, so uh, the, they would argue that that view doesn't uh, accurately take into account multiple biological contributors to an individual's sex, uh, where that's an array of organic, character, uh, organic characteristics, um, notwithstanding that some are more outwardly apparent than others. Um, and they have argued that a more nuanced view appears to be supported by the empirical observations of, of uh, recent researchers. Um, some people who have a view different than you have also argued that uh, because this is a social construction uh, of sex, it oversimplifies the sex of individuals and it actually reinforces conservative and patriarchal nor uh, social norms of identity. So my question is, uh, given that knowledge of, hu of human biology, which is complex, is also imperfect, does your certainty about the appropriateness of your definitions derive more from ideology, or uh, is it based in the empirical? Um, is there no possibility that when the transgendered uh, say that they have a strong internal sense of their identity, uh, that that couldn't actually have a an organic basis? I mean, sex is binary. There's nothing that anyone can do about it that's science-based. I mean, there's male and female. There's people who have intersex conditions. Um, it's really easy to tell who's male and female. Like I said, you can tell by a blood test. You can tell by bones, things like that. Uh, and I don't understand... I mean, the idea that sex is binary and that male and females exist isn't a conservative view or a patriarchal view. It's just a reality. Um, it's how we reproduce. 
it's human. Um, so yeah, and I did want to I did want to mention something that isn't directly about your question, but we, we were talking about Castor Semenya early, and Castor Semenya has an intersex condition, um, so she has internal testes and then more testosterone, as you mentioned. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, and it has nothing to do with your brain. So sex doesn't have to do with your brain, and intersex conditions don't have to do with your brain. It's it's a physical condition. Does that answer your questions? Really simple? I could probe a bit more later, but I mean, I think it's fair to turn it over to Francis for the next one. Okay. Okay, so I guess I should ask Megan a question then, since I asked Julie a question. So we'll try and rotate things around a little bit so it's, we can mix and match a little bit. So Megan, um, I'm interested uh, in probing your, your thoughts about patriarchy. Um, because I think that is probably a big difference between you and Julie's views. You probably have different conceptions of what patriarchy is about. And um, what is, what, why do you think that there is this uh, male oppression of women? You did mention that it was biological differences that you think is at the root of it. Um, and I've often wondered at myself, but looking at feminist theory as to what what is the, at the root, is it reproductive? So men want to know who their children are? Is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about physical strength, that men are generally stronger than women, and therefore they just use their power to the extent that they can, and because they're stronger they're able to, to do that? Um, and also there's some views about it that it's property, and this is, comes from the socialist tradition actually, um, Frederick Engels about, you know, uh, origins of the family, private property in the state, that it was actually when property started to be accumulated that men began to be concerned about controlling women. So what's, what are your thoughts on, on the origins of patriarchy? I think you've got it mostly right. It originated so that men could tell who their children were and control their bloodline. Um, and it also manifests itself today in terms of male violence against women, which is, you know, in large part because men are stronger than women for the most part. There's not much we can do about that. Um, and it also happens because males are in a position of power in our society. So it started with biology and then connected to gender and gender, so these stereotypes and these roles that are enforced on people, whether or not they're male and female, are imposed on people. So like I said, women were said to be, you know, their natural places in the home, they shouldn't be involved in public life, in politics, in certain careers, um, because they were too delicate and too emotional and hysterical and irrational and passive, whereas men were inherently in other ways, so they're naturally suited towards those positions. But yeah, the, the, it originated because of reproductive capabilities. So just as a follow-up then, um, do you think that there's any oppression of um, male to female transgender people? Does that enter, does, does patriarchy play a role in the oppression of male to female transgender totally. people? I mean, patriarchy enforces masculinity on men, so men are punished when they step outside those gender roles and bully, like little boys are bullied if they don't, you know, perform masculinity properly, properly if they wear dresses, if they don't act in masculine ways, if they're emotional, if they cry, um, the way that people respond to, to boys who don't, who don't properly do masculinity is in a way that teaches those boys not to do that. I do think that patriarchy is, is bad for everyone. Thank you. So, just to probe a little bit further on, on my earlier question, uh, so some of the research uh, that has emerged over the last few years has concerned uh, the structure of uh, structures in, in the brains of transgendered people as compared to uh, cisgendered people. And there is research pointing to actually some biological differences or some structural differences in the brain. So I'm just wondering if, if you know, uh, with my previous question in mind, um, how you would, uh, essentially reduce, how you can justify reducing the notion of, uh, of sexual identity down to something as simple as a blood test. Who, like, who are we talking about when we're talking about transgender people? How are we defining that word? So those who identify uh, 
as a different. Uh, so it has nothing to do with like a brain test. It's just somebody who stands up and announces that they're actually a woman or actually a man. Well, how do we? Uh, let, let's I mean, if we were defining transgender based on some kind of medical test, then we could have that conversation, but we're not. We're talking about self-identification, so I'm criticizing ideology and legislation that is based entirely on somebody, you know, filling out a form and saying, yep, yeah, I'm male, and we just have to go with that. So I don't think we can talk about brain differences. I don't think that there's good evidence that shows these brain differences based on who is wearing a dress and who isn't wearing a dress, but, like... That's, that's not how we're defining so, transgender anyway, so I think that's a bit of a derail. So let, let me try the question a different way. Um, but we're not talking about sexual orientation, to be very, very clear, but let's use that by analogy. Um, until very recently, it was fairly uh, well, uh, it was common wisdom uh, that uh, people who were not heterosexual were either suffering from a mental illness or it was a choice, some, some, um, some aberrant behavior. Uh, and it's much more uh, widely, maybe not universally, but much more widely accepted now that when someone actually says that they are not heterosexual, and that's based on an, inter an internal sense, that that is not simply a social construct that's but been imposed on. Why is it? Why is it not? Why? Why do we not extend the same? Uh, 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 because who cares? I mean, we, first of all, we should be supporting people who are same-sex attracted, regardless of whether it's natural or chosen. People have the right to love who they want to love and be in a relationship with who they want to be. And there's a, there's a, we have a definition for a lesbian. It's a woman who's attracted to other women and who wants to partner with other women. We don't have a definition for transgender, so I don't know how we can have this conversation. What does it mean? Who are we talking about? Who is this group? How are we defining this group? Over to you. Okay, so I should ask Julie qu a question to give you some able time. Um, so I, I, I just want to get into this, um, the biology. I, I still am having a hard time understanding the, this kind of... Uh, there's transgender people who are not intersex. They're, they're just standard biology one way or another. I think saying standard is, again, a simplification because okay. there's so many different aspects that encompass both biological, <coughs> biological sex, essentially, okay. that we're just focusing on the aspects that we can see. The problem is that there's so much that we can't see and we don't understand that we're starting to only understand in the last decade when we're looking at brain structures that we don't have the capabilities right now to do on a cheap level as to understand those brain structures, maybe in the future it'll be possible. Um, as uh, Clark's Third Law says, any uh, sufficient enough uh, technology is indistinguishable from magic. You know, it's that same idea, this idea that it's based on feelings, it's magic, it's not. There could be a biological, there is evidence pointing towards a biological aspect, and soon we will hopefully understand it better, but right now we have a very limited understanding. Um, okay, so just to probe a little bit deeper into this area, um, so there, 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 are cert there are some uh, biological bases to all trans people. Like, like, there's something biological going on for all trans people. It's not just as Megan is saying, um, this seems to be the di a difference between you, is that Megan is claiming that there's some people who are transgender who just have a psychological belief that they are transgender, and there's nothing about them biologically that makes them be the uh, the the be the what I don't I don't know even know how to phrase it yeah. in the terminology, but you know what I mean. Like there there there's something there's always something bio biological going on. Well, there obviously is something biological going on because that's the entire reason why dysphoria presents itself. If there was no neurological disconnect. Um, people wouldn't be going through the extreme depression and suicidality when they don't receive the medical treatment that they need or transgender-related medical care. And you see that in study after study, both hormonal therapy, um, social uh, acceptance, as well as surgery, reduces significantly suicidality and depression. Now, if that... When you look at how much it reduces it, it tells you that there's actually something biologically wrong. There, this isn't just something that somebody woke up one day and decided, otherwise they wouldn't be suicidal and depressed to a level that, you know, 
For, I believe the latest study is 48% of trans people have at least attempted suicide attempt once. And that's usually before transition. Uh, it, transition reduces it in every study that has been done comparing pre-transition to post-transition. It's been reduced drastically. If, if there were no biological condition going on, why is it occurring even outside of society in the bio biological sense? So we're coming up to time for the Q and A. So, but I'll I'll give the last question to Mark as to whatever whatever you desire, Mark. In terms of questions. Sure. So um, I develop, notice a pattern developing here, but uh, back to a question for for Megan. Um, so, it, a lot of the discussion around uh, the what what might be viewed by some as uh, the negative implications of of extending. Uh, legal protection to gender identity and, and gender expression uh, is often framed around, of course, bathrooms, as it has, has been pointed out, uh, uh, women's shelters, um, and, and the, the world of sport. Um, but what about all other uh, domains of, of, of human life and, and, and social, uh, social life? So, for example, if, if it's not possible for, for uh, gender expression and gender identity to be protected under human rights legislation, uh, what protections would there be, or should there be protections or not, for transgendered people, whether they're uh, transgendered women or men, or uh, they have some other uh, gender <coughs> identification, if, say, uh, they were denied a job uh, uh, after, after interviewing? Um, should there be no legal protections for uh, that type of discrimination? Is it, is it, in other words, do we take an absolutist view uh, to, to rights, or do we view rights as something to be balanced, uh, and uh, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because there are a few problem areas? Yeah, I mean, as I said, like, I think that we need to ensure that no one is discriminated against based on whether or not they properly perform masculinity or femininity. But I don't think that means that we need to create laws that allow people to literally self-identify as the opposite sex in order to do that. And those are the kinds of laws that we're creating. So we're creating laws that ensure that, you know, a person can fill out a form and change their ID from male to female based on nothing, based on... You know, you know, not being diagnosed with gender dysphoria, you know, nothing biological. Like I said, like, a, a lot of this that frustrates me is the lack of definition in terms of terms. We don't know who or what we're talking about, and so it can just be anything. And I do think that it's dangerous for males to just be able to announce, I'm a female and I should be allowed to compete in sports against girls and women or uh, use women's facilities, enter into a transition house, enter into a women's change room. I mean, do we really not see any problems with this idea at all? You should go to the q &A. Okay, so I thank everyone. I'm, I'm very pleased, I'm very excited about this event. Um, I can see there's a lot of emotion in the crowd and folks are trying to stay calm and I strongly appreciate it. You have no idea how appreciative I am. Uh, and, so I thank you. Now I know. <laughs> Let's see how it goes in the QA period. But uh, again, I want to thank you again for it. I.e., I'm hinting at continuing this. Uh, so the idea goes as follows. Uh, line up kindly at the microphone. Do we have just one microphone? I think oh, we just do. One. Okay, so obviously line up at the one microphone. I should put my glasses on. Good question. As far as like people that have privacy concerns and can't be filmed or don't want to be filmed, and how they get removed from this after it's being posted. Or maybe we can everyone is going to be filmed. If you don't want to be filmed, you should not speak. So sorry, we've been filming the audience. So I'm just I'm concerned about privacy because the audience has been filmed. So I'm just wondering what's going to be happening if there's someone we can tell afterwards that we'd like to be removed, as there was no signs posted or anything outside of this. Yeah, actually, there was nothing posted, and I didn't sign. So I'm actually right now saying I will not be filmed, which means everybody in this cone is not going to be filmed. So I just want to make sure privacy is protected. That's all. Okay, well, you'll have to talk to the documentary uh, filmmaker about that. No, I don't know. No, 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 no. You can delete any footage of the gold to my face and the face of anyone else who might be caught with my face. This is a public university. Again, no expectation of privacy. I think it's important maybe to kind of put a hold on this one, uh, if you don't mind. 
because otherwise we won't have the question and you know and it's all yes, fair yes, yes, not to derail this uh, I'm not trying to derail no, I, I completely respect it but at the same time you should continue uh, if, okay. if you don't mind uh, so I'm sorry but this, these are there are vulnerable populations here and I think that the camera should be turned off right now because these populations are asking for that to take place and this is not derailing the conversation. Oh, you don't this get is to control the event. No, this I think is a respectful request from the audience to please stop filming. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So we will not film. If you do not come That's up to the mic, and Miriam is saying, yes. if you want to, if you want to ask a question without being filmed, she will hold a handhold mic at the back, and you can ask a question without being filmed. So that's a compromised position. Okay. So let us begin. Um, so if you could kindly line up at the microphone and if you could introduce yourself, if you're comfortable with that. And, uh, and uh, ask a question. Uh, now, before you begin kindly, if folks come up, if you could kindly alternate the questions to both panelists. I know as a mathematician, random doesn't mean switching, but let's have some at the end 50% target. Thank you. Okay, uh, there was a lot going on there, so uh, just Took down a few notes, so as a preamble, I'm just going to say I uh, heard a lot of words like equality seeking, we should all be. Um, not assume affectations. An affectation is me wearing a leather jacket in the summer, uh, not a gender. Um, shelters, etc., resource. Like the entire conversation so far seems to stem from the inability of some faculty members to expand beyond their own discipline to take a look at things like actual biological uh, studies that have been done regarding the wide spectrum of not only physiological but also neurological uh, variants in the human body as relates to gender and in gender expression. Uh, I think that the way we conceive of gender, the whole idea that it is time-tested and traditional is scary as hell because so is a lot of spousal abuse. Um, there are there are arguments that are being fallen back on which do not in any way refer to statistics or science, but merely to the opinions of a certain member of the faculty. And my question to you then is, if you are going to be telling people that they are faking their gender or that they are undergoing violence, ostracism, uh, exclusion, persecution, uh, long wait times with the medical professionals, psychological evaluations, and they're doing all of this just so that they can get into the women's bathroom. I think you overestimate the desire of some people to get into the women's bathroom. Also, we need to, if we're going to have this discussion, perhaps get a clear definition of what exactly you mean when you say man or woman, since you seem to have very, very definitive ideas of what falls into that. And I need to know what that means biologically, behaviorally, and how all of that ties together to give one exact coordinate to which I must angle my star if I am going to present as male, uh, or to which I'm going to present my star if I were someone who was going to present as female. Because right now, you're using a lot of wishy-washy words to kind of dive in between giving an actual definition that can then be challenged. Well, I Thank did you. provide I a think definition. Give, give a goal post, so and then we'll I put think you would like to Thank ask you. a Thank you very much. in response, Fire how do you define woman? How do I define a woman? Someone who defines themselves as a woman. There are too many factors so they that What are they defining themselves as when they're defining themselves as a woman? They're, designing, they're defining themselves as a noun in the English language, which carries what with it What does that noun mean? If I can, I would like to interject at this point. Oh. Obviously, to ask a question and listen to the answer, the important thing in a kind of a rational discussion is to ask a question and thank you very much and let uh, Megan respond and rather than... respond to the question, so... Uh, that is good. I'm just shutting it down actually now. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, let Megan respond to your question and then you can certainly follow up, but I don't want this frequency to be like 15 yeah. hertz or something. Thank you. I mean, it's just... So, as I said in my opening remarks, it's really difficult to have this conversation if we're not defining terms in a clear way. So, I define a woman as an adult female human. I define a man as an adult male human. And then what trans activists, I mean, I can't tell if what you're saying, is, is, is there no such thing as a man or a woman? Like, female. does that not exist? Do, do males just, and females female, exist? Female is just a thesaurus word for woman. Right? So what's a woman? Does that There's exist? No, I'm is that you, a material thing? I've defined it. Trying to set a goal. Like, no, you haven't. Right? Okay, what's, <laughs> what's, what is, okay, sorry, let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. I'm talking yes. now. So okay. I'm going to know. 
Is the act? Is there no such thing as male or female? Is that not a real, tangible thing? We have borders and money, both of which are constructs and yet real. See, you can't answer the question. It's impossible. <laughs> no, you can. can you tell me? Can you please tell so me? So manipulative. I, I honestly just like, want to know. Can't just pretend okay, so that you said a so female goal. So what is a female then? Biologically speaking, what is the actual goalpost that says? This person here it's, is a member sure. of this species that's able to uh, grow babies inside of them. You're my yeah. Okay, so I think you're here, you're here. Okay. we're not getting anywhere with this question, but thank, thank you. So, so, let's go to the next question, please, okay? Trans activists are going to Next question. Women are women over and over and over again. What are they We're not getting anywhere with this question, so. There are ex-white people who can have babies. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next question. Now the format I would like to run uh, is to ask a question, please, and then maybe have time to respond. And sure, there is a question on the question. I understand that, but let's please keep the frequency down. Otherwise, it becomes a shouting match, and that's not what we intended, and that's not what we what I want here. Thank you. I will use my voice. <laughs> Did someone turn it off? I don't know. This is the force of the universe. Hello. There you go. Can you hear? Okay, great. This question is actually for both Megan and Julie, so I would appreciate both of your responses on the matter. And Julie, you have such a lovely smile, so thank you for keeping such a positive vibe. Um, my question to both of you is, if you... S so, Megan, I'm kind of going off a term that you used. If you say binary sex, so terms like male and female, are terms tested in time, what do you have to say for places, languages, cultures around the world who define or have defined gender in more than two categories? For example, two spirit identities who are part of the indigenous community on Turtle Island before pre-contact. So that's my question to both of you. Um, I don't have an answer. I'm genuinely curious what the two of you think about that. If I can have Julie respond now, so we alternate, uh, if you don't mind. I think they're the, the, the truth of the matter is that even as we understand it now, there have been trans people throughout history, even in societies that have a binary. There was a Roman emperor, Egalapulus, don't quote me on that, but look them up. They, they are known to have been transgender and wanted to be referred to as an empress and wanted to actually go through medical transition. Look at people like um, Le Chevalier de Hon, who um, was a French spy, and it's there's evidence that they used a primitive form of hormonal treatment. Um, so. Outs even outside of the third sex, like the Hijra in India and the Two-Spirit indigenous people, um, there have been all sorts of forms in bo both just gender expression as well as biological sex as to the need to knowing that something is wrong with your body. And I think one of the things that kept, keeps falling on a lot from gender critical sides, I'm not saying you specifically, but what I hear, Megan, um, is that if this is actually a biological reality, what was ha where were these people 50 years ago? And the truth is, where were people who had diabetes 50 years ago when we didn't have treatments for that? I mean, the more treatment we have, the more people we're able to save. They're, pro they're likely, I, I can tell you as for myself, I probably wouldn't have survived to adulthood if I hadn't been able to re receive medical treatment, but thankfully I don't live in that era. Um, so the more medical treatment and the medical capabilities we have, the more people we're able to save, and that, that should be the direction we're going in. I mean, to be clear, I'm not opposing medical treatment for anyone. Um, and if an individual adult wants to get cosmetic surgery, that's their choice. Um, I am critical of cosmetic surgery when women get it, so I do think that we should ask critical questions about these surgeries and the impact of hormones on people, but I'm not trying to stop anyone from having those procedures if they want to, and if that'll make them feel better and happier, then they can do that. Um, in terms of the question around two-spirit and things like that, I mean, I, none of us can, I mean, indigenous cultures are very diverse. 
Um, so there were lots of different systems and cultures. We can't act like there's this big blanket and indigenous culture is just indigenous culture. It wasn't the same everywhere. Um, and what my indigenous sisters in the feminist movement have told me about that idea of two spirit was that, you know, they didn't erase the idea of biological sex. So they didn't say that a person who was acting outside of whatever gender roles, gender norms, was literally the opposite sex. They just accepted that person as they were, which I think is what we should do also. Yep. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, I am here talking as a mother. My, my, one of my daughters is a, a MIT student for a year of one career here, and one day she came home and she said, can you believe, Mom, that in the washroom there was a guy? And you are not allowed to ask that person if <coughs> what he was doing do there, because he, he identified as a woman. And uh, as a mother who is concerned about the kid's safety, and, and Julie mentioned something about the right to feel safe, I, I, I cannot uh, remember exact words, but how can you explain a woman who, in a lot of cases, and the numbers are very high, have been sexually molested in their own bathrooms at home, in, in, on the street, on the train, everywhere? It, I don't think that our main concern is about the transsexual uh, males who are in our washroom. We are afraid of the men who can identify as a women who are going to go actually deliberately into washrooms to abuse kids. A woman like myself, I have the strength, I guess, I wish, to defend myself, but a lot of kids, a lot of young women like my daughter can be sexually abused in the bathroom, and that is a fact. Women are sexually abused in bathrooms, so I would like you to explain me. As a, as a woman, right? And I'll respond back as a woman as well. <laughs> so what I said uh, is that you have the right to feel, to be safe. You don't have the right to feel safe. And what I mean by that is that the legislation that we should be seeking should be based on data rather than feelings. Uh, it's, it's a fact that still in today's society, you know, if someone is walking down the street and sees a person of color walking towards them, they'll cross the street or grab their purse a little tighter because they don't feel safe. But the truth is, they're not any less safe by that person being there in public with them. It's the same in this case. Now, as to the individual being there, I think you can still ask somebody, it's like, hey, are you, is it okay, are you in the right bathroom, just making sure. But if that person says, yes, I, I am, leave them alone unless they actually do something. Again, we have to set legislation and we have to enforce regulations based on behavior and not identity. If someone is doing something suspicious, go ahead and re definitely report them. I, I definitely say you should report them, you should say something, they should, if they're doing something uh, lascivious or lewd, they should be arrested. But we don't police people's identities because then we're going down a rabbit hole that the most affected people are going to be gender non-conforming cisgender women in this case, which we see in the data. The majority of people who are harassed in bathrooms because of trans regulation are gender non-conforming cisgender women, not trans women. Trans women are just killed <laughs> and beat up. Yes. Yes. Chrissy Lee Paulus. I mentioned the case of Chrissy Lee Paulus. Yes. You're looking at another one. Okay. So thank you. we'll stick to the questions at the microphone. So next question, please. Hello. Uh, thank you both for being like so communicative. I really appreciate it. I think it is an important conversation to have. I think that um, it would be really interesting to uh, have a conversation if we had all like read any of Gina Rippon's work on neuroplasticity or Cordelia Fine's work on socialization and how gender actually kind of changes the way your brain lights up when you see things that you're interested in. And it's not brain sex, it's more like neuroplasticity. Anyway, um, for Julie, uh, you drew a line between 
uh, gender critical feminists and conservatives with regard to the Heritage Foundation, um, I would like to have both of you speak um, specifically about uh, the no platforming of gender critical feminists, particularly Megan regarding Jonathan Jessica Yanov, and uh, whether you support the uh, the deplatforming of feminists. Like, if we are not allowed to talk, if we're if we're getting kicked off of off of our off of these platforms for questioning any of these things, because you know that questions are verboten when it comes to gender critical activism or anything. We're not allowed to say what do you mean when you say woman. You're not allowed to say men can't be women. We can't ask these questions. I literally got a 12-hour suspension for telling a guy to get his child prostate checked because he can identify as a woman, but that doesn't make his prostate disappear. And I also said surrogacy is not cloning, and it's still, I got, like, it was ridiculous. So can you talk about how you expect gender critical feminists to react when we're being no platform, then we're being offered these platforms? I don't, by the way, necessarily disagree with you that, uh, that super conservatives in the states are using gender critical um, views in order to bolster their anti-women's rights stuff, but that does not mean that gender critical feminists are conservative, especially since the talk that you're talking about at the Heritage Foundation, they didn't have anybody on the conservative side postulating, they had just strictly feminists talking, that was a really interesting talk. Anyway. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, on that specifically, I think you have to question specifically on the Heritage Foundation stuff. Let me start there because it's the most current thing in my mind. Um, you have to start questioning when a group you don't agree with asks you to advocate on their behalf of something you agree with. You really have to start questioning why they're doing it in this case. And I'll give you an example personally. Um, something that I don't agree with with liberals in, in the states specifically is I actually have some very strong Second Amendment views. But regardless of that, I would not go on Dana Lash, who's a very, very uh, conservative pro-gun advocates program, to espouse views that we both agree with. Because I have to think in the back of my mind that she has an agenda in that case. If, we both, if I'm espousing something that she's actually agreeing with, you have to start thinking about, like, how are these people planning to use it? And that's why I bring up the Heritage Foundation specifically. There might not have been conservatives on there, but you can bet that conservatives are using that exact same, those exact same words, uh, as I mentioned, to uh, bring forth anti-women's reproductive. Sure, but they weren't asked to speak on behalf of the Heritage Foundation. I don't know how exactly that, that, that event was set up, but those women have been, like Julia Beck, has, she got the boot from a, from a lesbian like from a from the gay what is it commission I guess in Portland like she got kicked off of that and like nobody was allowed to, nobody would host her anymore so I I think it's important to to distinguish that she that they weren't asked to come be like hey come talk about how conservative radical feminism is um, but yeah so how do you feel about the deplatforming of gender critical feminists? Sure. So what I'll say about uh, the deplatforming thing I think we have to make a distinction of what is a public space versus a private space, and in, in terms what is uh, what is a business in itself. For example, I might not agree with the policies of Twitter, but they're a company. They're, they have terms of service. If you agree to them, you have to go by them. Now, that's not to say that you can't or that you shouldn't ask them, hey, can you do things in a different way? But as a company, as a private company, they have the right to have their position. Now, that's not stopping somebody else from creating, let's say, a gender critical feminist version of Twitter and having that out there and booting trans people. I mean, if that's a private business, that's absolutely their right, but maybe that makes me more of a capitalist than uh, that's than typical liberals. That is that, so since we're not allowed to be on Twitter, we should create our own our own systems to, to talk about it. We should be it's okay that that people like Megan are being kicked off for asking questions about gender. Well, that's not my decision to make because I don't own Twitter. But that's why I asked for your perspective <laughs> yeah. on the issue. Well, my perspective is that they're a private business. They so have the right cool. to do business as they see fit. Now. Would I make that same decision if I own Twitter? Probably not. But as a business, they have the right to do business as they see fit for their profit. Okay. Megan, could you please speak? So, I mean, we recently organized an event in Vancouver to talk about this issue, gender identity and women's rights, at the Vancouver Public Library, which is a public space, and trans activists demanded that that event be shut down. 
Um, so, I mean, the the library could not shut it down because they're legally obligated to support free speech. Um, but the demands of trans activists are that we stop speaking. And lots of trans activists supported me getting kicked off Twitter for referring to men as he and for distinguishing between males and females and for asking questions about gender identity. I mean, on Twitter I've been subjected to countless violent threats and harassment over and over and over and over and over again and nothing's been done and I've never harassed or threatened anyone in my life. I was kicked off for asking questions and I think we do have to acknowledge that what trans activists are trying to do is to silence our speech and to prevent us from talking. In terms of the issue around conservatives and the right um, using, I don't, I don't use the term gender critical feminist. Uh, feminism is gender critical, so there's no reason to use that term. There's, if you're, if you're not critical of gender stereotypes and these sexist roles that are imposed on us, then you're not a feminist. That's what feminism is. That's what feminism has always done. Um, Julia Beck went and spoke at the Heritage Foundation because no one else would platform her. Liberals on the left will not platform feminists who want to talk critically about gender identity. And she went there and she made radical feminist arguments to a right-wing audience. And she talked about being a lesbian and how gender identity ideology was affecting her as a lesbian, her right to be a lesbian and to um, not be attracted to and not date and not par partner with men. Um, and I think she's very brave to do that. Um, every time I talk to liberal media or mainstream media, they manipulate what I've said. They rewrite my quotes. Um, they manipulate my arguments. In Canada, they refuse to even cover this issue. You know, I didn't get a call from the CBC to comment on my own event and my own views. They had uh, people on to talk about and speculate about what I might say, but they wouldn't have me on to defend myself. That's the reality. Liberal media is not even acknowledging that this debate is happening, and we're fighting to have this debate, and trans activists are just trying to shut it down. No. Thank you. Let me just really quick, I want to make a distinction because it's on the same topic. We have to distinguish what is public versus private funds, uh, because it's uh, the Vancouver Women's Rape Center. Um, oh, uh, yeah, Vancouver Rape Relief. Oh, I'm sorry, Vancouver Rape Relief. Um, them losing their grant, that's public funds. That, that's a different discussion from raising funds for it. And to bring that back in the U.S., the Violence Against Women's Act was, uh, they voted on the reauthorization last week, and actually Julia Beck was the one on the panel who was brought in by conservatives. And using her argument, they tried to bring in a religious exemption uh, specifically targeting religious organizations that provide the sort of care for women who make that distinguish, distinction between trans women and cisgender women in, in this case. And it was voted down because, yes, they have, as an organization, they have the right to deny service to whoever they want to. However, do they get to do that with public funds is the question. And in this case, they decided no. And that's, that's, that's what I agree with. I, I do not agree with deplatforming private um, spaces. For example, Heritage Foundation wants to have that decision. That's the private entity. I don't agree with that being deplatformed. But a public space, there's a distinction that, that, has, to, that has to be made and is made legally. Thank you. Okay. Um, That's the next question, please. I'm, I'm here to support Megan. On the public versus private, I've read a lot of stuff about how organizations like Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, they're very misogynistic. And even if you, have, <coughs> even if you own a private company, you still have a public responsibility. And it's not as like a free speech just because you don't agree with the current agenda of the day, and you're accused of not being on the right side of history, you still have a right to speak. And I'm, I'm not on social media. I think with the men, mostly, in, at those different social, social media sites, are really doing us females a disfavor, in favor of listening to men who want to be women talk over us. 
And in, in a lot of ways, I look at this as appropriation. It's taking away what defines us as females, biologically, and saying anybody can be a female. And for most of us, we actually have, you know, we have to accept our biological sex. We don't have a problem. But it's for that one, less than 1% that we're making all these changes to society. And I wonder what's going to happen to young people in the future when they're faced with all this pressure from social media to be one way or the other, and they just can't be like a tomboy or an effeminate male, that they must transition to be accepted. When I never had to grow up with that, I didn't care about my playing with boys. It didn't matter. I was still considered a girl. And even if I had short hair, I was a girl. So I don't like those sets of stereotypes, and I probably never will. Oh. And I just want to, I, I just to talk, I just ask the question about how much influence we think social media has on what we are dealing with today. A question to both, both panelists or just one? Let me just ask because uh, I, I just want to respond because you said some things in there towards me. I, in, the ter in the service of giving definitions, I just want to point out one really quick thing. I'm not, I'm from the U.S., so I just know free speech laws as they exist in the U.S. I'm not sure if it's the same thing in Canada, but in the U.S., free speech laws protect you from government persecution. They don't entitle to you to a right over the, the uh, over private companies. So that's a very clear distinction to be made. I mean, if you're being persecuted by the government, that's, that's a free speech law issue. Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr is not technically a free speech issue because they are not part of the government. I mean, what's technically true and technically not true is is one thing, but we all know that Twitter is shaping public discourse and has an enormous impact on politics and elections. So I think that in this day and age, um, it's uh, sort of lacking in integrity if we pretend that Twitter doesn't have the power to silence and to, to shape what people believe. And Twitter allows pornography on their platform, and they defend themselves. And they say, you know, oh, we can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about it. We're the platform. If people put that stuff there. There's nothing we can do about it. And yet they're cracking down ideologically uh, on people that they disagree with politically, and in particular on women who just are stating material reality, who are stating facts. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I do think that it's wrong. and. I think that we should be challenging that, and um, I, I mean, Twitter, Twitter knows that they're a place where, they, they've, they've claimed that they're a place for free speech and free expression over and over and over again. That's what they said the purpose of their platform was, and now they're trying to suddenly backpack, because, backtrack because of a, a, few, a few activists, I mean, this is a minority point of view that it's possible to change sex. The large majority of the population doesn't believe that's possible. And just on the um, uh, what um, self-identification, um, I think we should be glad we're not in Britain, but you can be investigated by the police if you say the wrong thing. And Canadian and activists are fighting for that also. They're fighting to, you know, there's you know, a politician in Vancouver, Morgan Auger, who's claiming over and over and over again that women who are trying to have these conversations are literally guilty of hate speech and hate crimes. And no, we need to talk about it. Hate. Yeah, we, like, we need to talk about whether or not we value democracy and, and public debate and, and free speech in Canada. This is an important, an important thing that we should be defending. You never know when free speech laws are going to turn around and, like, impact you and suddenly you can't say what you think about gender identity, ideology, I mean, the, the idea that we can all control who's, who's punished by these laws is naive. Um, when, um, okay, thank you. Okay. Running a little bit of time. Just, so we got 15 minutes here, um, and we have how many? Five people. Yeah. Can I ask for three minutes for each? Because 15 divided by five is three. Uh, so... <laughs> I know it's going to be tough, but I don't want the people who lined up to go without a question. So if you could make it really brief and brief answers, I would deeply appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So my question is for both uh, Megan and Julie. Thank you for coming out. 
um, especially from me here, I am someone who's completely foreign to this entire topic. Um, I don't know very many people who are part of the community, I know a few, right, who are both, you know, feminists who disagree with the gender identity and as uh, trans individuals, um, but I'm, I'm not well acquainted with it. So my question to both of you is simply this on limits. It seems evident that there would be circumstances in which things would reasonably be expected to be part of the community. Uh, an example of this is that there's a podcast who has a member on it who switches back and forth between various different identities. So at one moment they're Susanna, and then the next moment they're Mark, and then they're Susanna again. And I've heard a number of trans people say, well, that's a legitimate thing that does happen in the community. Uh, and then recently we just had, in Great Britain, just last week, um, uh, hip-hop artist Zuby break the female deadlift and um, squat records, I think it was, because he briefly identified as female, and then after he broke the records, transitioned back to female. Obviously, most people would acknowledge that that's a silly thing. As well, you in your uh, comments, Julie, you said you have the right to be safe, but not the right to feel safe, which is a very reasonable expectation. I think that's a very common sense thing to say. But then just here in our own event here today, we had the members on uh, one side of the audience I'm sitting on become very, very agitated that they were being filmed. They are completely safe. They just don't feel safe while being filmed. And so my question to you, this is a legitimate question because I don't understand the limits from both of you, is where do you set the limits in this conversation so that people like me who are trying to learn have an idea of where we should start and what we should be looking at? Thank you. Get, get asked for a very quick answer because there's yet another person and it's number six now. So, so oh, quick. Thank you. really quick, I, I do think that the discussions that should be had should be around limits and not around existence because the problem is making it a zero-sum game. Making it a zero-sum game is always going to be seen as a negativism. Um, in terms of Zubu, I, I, or I don't know who that is, Zubi. Zubi. <laughs> Um, he did not go through the current medical requirements as stated by the IOC to be able to compete in the women's categories. So yes, I disagree that he should be able to do that. Sorry, I'm, I'm just looking at Megan and Julie's answers. Okay, Megan, please. I mean, so again, I mean, I've, I've repeated this a, a couple of times already, I think is that we're, we're changing policies and legislation in order to ensure that people can just self-identify. So there's no, there's no, you gotta get a doctor's note, there's no, you have to see a psychologist, there's no, you have to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. So that's why feminists have started speaking out about this in large part, is because all these laws and policies are changing so that it's all based on self-identity. -identi so theoretically you could just, you know, be like, uh, switching back and forth. I'm not saying that's what people are doing all the time, but that's what we're defending in terms of these, these laws and policies, and, and that's troubling. You know, like I said, there's no, we don't have a, a cohesive definition for what a transgender means, or what a transgender person is, or even what gender identity means, and, and we're creating really, really quickly these, these policies and legislations around these ideas, and denying a public debate and refusing to let people ask questions. I, I literally know people who've been fired from their job just for talking about this and asking critical questions. Um, of course, there's, like I said, I mean, I got violent threats over that uh, library event. They were really disgusting, sexualized, misogynistic threats. Like, it's scary to speak out about this, and there's real consequences. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, so my question is for Julie. I was just wondering, uh, how would you sort of reconcile the uh, ideas of feminism and being pro-trans at the same time? Because I think traditionally uh, feminism has been about challenging or even abolishing social norms, as in you're not shoehorned into a label based on your sex. Whereas I feel being uh, transgender is sort of uh, sort of perpetuates social norms where your thoughts and behaviors um, determine what like society labels you as, which I feel is sort of an opposing viewpoint. So I was just wondering if you think you could be transgender and feminist at the same time. Thank you. Well, yeah, you kind of have to. And I mean, going back to that, um, trans people in their activism have been pushing to eliminate those societal those societal ideas. Again, going back to the DSM-4 versus DSM-5 change, 
the reason why the DSM-4 was so problematic is that it conflated gender non-conforming people with gender dysphoria, and these are two entirely, completely different things, and it was only trans people who spent decades uh, fighting to get that changed so that now gender dysphoria is recognized as apart from gender non-conforming. You can be gender non-conforming and not fall under that gender identity disorder definition nowadays, thanks to trans people, and that to me is feminism. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, so our discussion kind of ended with this the couple to define what transgender okay. is, and my question is to Julian, and maybe you can follow up on that. Um, what I've read is so that in the community, minutes. you there's two major conditions: there's gender dysphoria and left. gender euphoria. And I'm wondering what your like 34 minutes left. Okay. What you thought about what who belongs and who can identify as transgender given those two terms that exist. Gender euphoria isn't uh, a, any sort of medical diagnosis. Gender euphoria is just, it, in my opinion, because I use the term a lot, is just ways in that our gender is a firm that makes us feel like, oh my god, we feel normal for once. And I will say, usually, uh, like, I'll give you an example. I did a race uh, dressed as a princess a couple, uh, uh, for the Disney Princess Half Marathon a couple weeks ago. And one thing that I really liked is that when they, they put all the princes in these really big heels, so when I got my picture, I was shorter than them. That to me is gender euphoria because it feels <laughs> <laughs> it feels validating. So it's not a medical diagnosis, it's just a way for trans people to describe how good it feels to be affirmed in your gender. Thank you. Next question. Yes, hi. Um, so I'm a journalism professor here at Matt Royal, so I speak in my capacity as a, as a faculty member. And also in my capacity... Sorry? Can hear you, Mike. Ah. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I'm used to being a boomer, so, you know. Uh, so I, I speak in the capacity as a, a faculty member here and also as a journalism professor. Um, and, and in that capacity, I'm always in favor of more public discussions about controversial issues. Uh, but that being said, um, I had a question for both of you about this event and the way it's been structured. So this event um, is defined as a as part of the Rational Space Network. And implicit in that description, I think, is, is two things. One is that reason is the highest value that we should be aspiring to, uh, especially at this institution. And the second thing that it implies is that one side in this discussion might be irrational. Um, so, with that in mind, it seems that we are ignoring another major part of democratic discussion, and Enlightenment philosophers would agree with this, uh, which is empathy. Um, and, Megan, I've heard you in this discussion be pretty unempathetic, right? I mean, you've referred to transgenderism as being based on nothing and lies. I mean, that those are your words, not mine. So it, it strikes me that, that if we are going to have positive conversations about controversial issues, and as I say, I think that's an important thing, that in addition to having a rational discussion, we should also have an empathetic discussion. And so I would like I both, question? Okay. Yeah, so I would like both uh, of you to comment on that idea and whether or not we've achieved that today. Thank you. I mean, I would argue that it's not very empathetic to take money away from a women's race, rape crisis shelter and transition house that exists here to protect women who are abused. Um, I also don't think that we need to lie in order to be empathetic. I mean, I'm not going to say something that's untrue. I don't know that it's important in order to be able to respect people that we we lie about material reality and what's possible. I also find that trans activism is incredibly unempathetic to women. I mean, we're being vilified and smeared and fired and threatened 
And there have actually been physical attacks from trans activists on feminists who just want to have this conversation, who are trying to talk. It's not empathetic. I mean, we're seeing like these like turfs die, kill turfs. Um, we're being accused of being fascists and Nazis because we're making basic feminist arguments and again trying to talk. I mean, the notion that feminists are not being empathetic because they're trying to protect women's rights and they're trying to talk about these ideas that again are, are pretty incoherent but are being incorporated into legislation that impacts our rights. Um, I think is is kind of ridiculous, to be honest. I mean, being empathetic to women, we're talking about allowing males into ent to enter into any space they want, any woman's space, and we're saying, well, who cares about these women's feelings? These men feel a certain way. They want to be in their spaces. Like, how is that empathetic to women? What about women's feelings? What about girls' feelings? What about girls who don't want a grown man with his dick out in their change room? Do you mind if I ask you a question, Megan, just in the sense of uh, what you were talking about the grant for the for Vancouver Women's Shelter. Um, you say that you're against activism to decide where funds go. Um, you published on Feminist Current a letter in support of Graham Linehan, who advocated and tried to get public grants in the UK taken away from the uh, from Mermaids, uh, a charity that benefits trans youth. Do you agree in the same way that he that he should have done that, or in the same way that you don't believe trans activists should fight to get grants taken away from non-inclusive organizations? Do you also disagree with Graham's approach in that sense? I'm not against activism. Do all the activism you want. I think it's wrong. I think that it's wrong to try to take funds away from a woman's shelter. But do the, I'm not going to stop people from protesting. I'm not going to stop people from like trying to advocate politicians to make certain decisions around where money goes. I support that. Trans activists seem to be the ones that don't support our activism. Um, but yeah, I mean, do what you want. I think that it's disgusting. I think that it's misogynistic to try to shut down a rape crisis center in a transition house for women because they won't let men in, and when you're not even trying to build shelters for trans people. I mean, why don't they put that energy into trying to build services for trans people? Why is this activism all about tearing down instead of building up? I, I don't think, think it's wrong. Yes. In that sense, really quick, I don't think it's that... I don't think people should be fighting to remove something, but pub when you're talking about public grants, that's something very specific to, to, to discuss. No one is stopping people from putting up their private funds, which I disagree with. And the other thing I wanted to say is I've been very vocal about how I disagree with any violent threat towards Megan or any other gender critical activist. I think we should never fall to that. We can have a discussion without going to violent threats. Thank you. Uh, we three more. Questions and we are up with time, but I suggest. How much can you go over time again? Well, five minutes. Like five minutes sure. Okay, so we're gonna have five minutes extra. So three people. Let's divide. That's not divisible. So this is. <laughs> Next question, please. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Julie. Um, so I was just reading a bit about Chrissy Lee Paulus, mm -hmm. um, and I saw a couple other cases about. Um, a trans woman being sexually assaulted in a woman's bathroom. I was wondering about, um, I don't know anything about if trans women have been assaulted by men in their bathrooms, but if there's still a risk that you could be assaulted by women in women's bathrooms, why does it matter which one you go into? Uh, the main reason is because, uh, again, as I said previously, sex and misogyny is based on conception. Uh, is, is based on societal perception and conception. The problem with, let's say, a trans woman using a male facility versus a female one is that by a trans woman who's perceived as female going into a male facility, she's immediately outing herself and making herself susceptible to violence. By going into a female facility, she has that perception, it's safer regardless. Yes, there's gonna be incidents, but the perception is is where the misogyny and the violence comes from, so if you can there, minimize that. Have there been cases of trans women assaulted by males in, in male bathrooms? Yes, plenty. Okay. Sexually assaulted as well, not just physically assaulted. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Next question. 
Hi, thank you. Um, my question is for Megan. Um, the default frame of this debate problematizes trans activism. Um, you've spoken a great deal about definitions, um, and you've, you've defined it as uh, those advocating for, I believe it was gender identity ideology. Um, but we've used the term in a variety of ways today, um, referring to what I would assume as largely unfavorable opinions from trans people. Um, so, in terms of definitions, how does the term trans activist differ meaningfully from trans person? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I, I think I explained that earlier, but I'll clarify again, is that I think that I, when I say trans activists, what I'm referring to is people who are advocating for gender identity ideology and gender identity legislation. So legislation that allows males to self-identify as females um, and vice versa. And gender identity ideology, meaning the idea that it's possible to be born in the wrong body, that it's possible to change sex, that some, there's some innate sense of gender that literally changes your biological sex. Next question. This is going quick. This is good. So my question is for Megan. Um, I'm just genuinely curious. Um, have, would you ever be willing, or have you sat down with trans men and women, particularly trans men and women of color, um, or do their stories just not matter to you? I'm willing to talk to anybody. I love talking to people, and I'm talk happy to talk to whoever. I've talked to transsexual people, for sure. I mean, all people who identify as transgender don't share the same opinions. This is not a monolith. You know, there's some people who probably agree with gender identity ideology. Obviously, there's others who disagree with it. And yeah, totally, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to anyone. Thank you. I guess we are up to time. That's it. So I would like to thank everyone for a very great event. I strongly appreciate it. Uh, so thanks again, and, uh, and Francis will speak now. Before, you, before everyone goes, um, first of all, we are going to the hub for drinks. If people would like some alcohol therapy, uh, you're welcome to come. Um, this is in this is in the uh, it's just up the it's it's close by it's in here. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to thank you very much, Julie and Meg. This is so great for you. Famous Mount Royal University mugs that we give all our presenters. Uh -huh. We have Mountain Space t-shirts. We probably are admiring the mind.